co-hosted with Stanford Hospital, a historical walking tour co-hosted by the Darien Historical Society, and an All Things Green Festival featuring 10 environmental groups in town celebrating Earth Day and everything sustainable in Darien. Patrons were invited on a scavenger hunt inside our LEED Gold Certified Building as they competed for the ultimate prize, a deluxe brand new composter. Patrons were introduced to heirloom gardening with the Cherry Lawn Gardens. They were invited on a video tour of our town's recycling uh, facility with City Carding. They mapped out trees with the Tree Conservancy, and they even got to hold a hedgehog from the Darien Nature Center. And specifically for our younger patrons, a sampling of programs might include our STEAM series from September to December, which focused on classes in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, the launch of Darien Library TV, a teen talent show, the 100 Before One program for parents of newborns, encouraging them to read to their babies, hosting local team bands in the same room again where we offer movies, cooking classes, book talks, sing-alongs, and just about anything else you can think of. And did you know that during the high school exam period we have a therapy dog named Ozzy who comes to ease the pre-exam anxiety we all remember so well? As one of our stellar librarians said, and I quote, the library of today may look a little different than your grandparents' library. Books and media will always be part of what we do, but we've also added 3D printers, museum passes, and passports to the mix. As anyone who's been at the Darien Library during the past year can tell you, the library of today is sometimes a noisy, raucous place. No longer is the bespectacled librarian someone who tells you to shush and shoes you out. Instead, the librarian of today encourages and fosters creation, discovery, and relationship building. It's been a busy year for us here at the Darien Library, but looking back only makes the future look that much more exciting. If we can do all this, what will happen next? Collaboration, creativity, and innovation, hallmarks of our incredible staff and our library, and it's your gifts that make their dreams a reality for the benefit of the whole town. So looking ahead to November 14th, we're gonna once again host our miniature golf event. You may have seen a hole. I think it's still there out by the front desk. That was a huge hit last year with families. So what's new this year is an event proceeding it on Friday night for adults only. Craft beer sliders and holes in one in the stacks. Come join us, it's gonna be a lot of fun. And since the phrase resting on our laurels is not one you're gonna find in any dictionary in this building, we're excited to announce yet another new event coming in the spring. It's going to be called Novel Tea and it will be an annual luncheon featuring a nationally recognized author. And I'm thrilled to announce that for our very first event, which will be March 2016, we're going to be welcoming Cheryl Strayed, the author of Wild. It's going to be a sellout, just like her book and her movie. So when you get your invitation, don't hesitate to buy your tickets. We have two trustees who are retiring tonight, both of whom have served two full three-year terms. First is Pam Clark. Pam worked on our program committee creating beautiful flower arrangements that decorated this room and much of the library space. And she also did a great job chairing our art committee, bringing an incredibly diverse group of artists, painters, printmakers, photographers, and even graffiti artists, and don't leave the library without checking out the gallery downstairs. She can't be here tonight, but I'd like to give her a hand for her many contributions. Second, Charlie Barnett. Charlie has been a highly diligent secretary for the last four years, delivering meticulous minutes after every board meeting. He was dogged in his pursuit of truth, clarity, and grammatical perfection. He's provided sage legal counsel, has served on the investment committee and the finance and budget committee, and shared the audit and law and policy committees, and has been a great and very trusted advisor to me in his role on the executive committee. We're gonna really miss having him around the table and we hope he won't be a stranger. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you. May I say something to the friends of the laundry? Please. I would like to. First, uh, our shot. Uh, six wallet size and an eight and a half. By 11 glossy, we'll be fine. No, I seriously want to say something about my experience on this wonderful board of trustees 
and let you friends of the library know how dedicated every trustee is. Uh, it has been a real joy and a real honor to be part of what is a crown jewel, if not the crown jewel of our town, a perfect combination of town support by the government and private um, fundraising through you. So it's been an honor, and I will miss being part of the board, but I know that everyone here will carry on the way the current board has done. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, next, we're going to move on to our nominating committee report from Trustee Jan Smith. Jan? Thanks, Amy. I'm uh, very pleased to tell you a little bit about the work of the nominating committee this year. Joining me on the committee this year were current trustees Sarah Francesi and Jay Schatz, as well as former trustees and friends of the library Susan Ballack and Kim Hufford. So I'd like to thank the committee for all their good work over the course of the summer. On behalf of the committee, I'm pleased to announce the following nominees. For a three-year term, 2015 through 2018, are Nick Bronca and Alex Ising. For re-election to a one-year term, current trustee Tad Smith, and for re-election to their second three-year term expiring in 2018, are Sarah Francesi and Jay Schatz. At this time, I would like to ask for a second from the floor, please. Thank you very much. Um, are there any nominations from the floor at this time? Thank you. Um, at this point, then, I would like to call for a vote from all of the friends of the library for the current slate as presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great, thank you very much. This concludes the report of the nominating committee. Thank you, Jan. Uh, now we're going to hear from our library director, Alan Gray. I'm gonna miss you, Amy, because I don't get to lift this up <laughs> when there's another speaker, when, uh, when someone else is the is the, the person that I'm speaking behind, I'm gonna to have to probably lower it. It's gonna be written. I've got the privilege of working with the finest group of librarians in any library in the nation in an extraordinary building that's the center of the community with a wealth of resources, databases, programs, a collection of books and DVDs and technology. Um, and each one of you who comes to the library can probably cite many examples of just fantastic customer service um, and hospitality that you've received for one or more of the members of the staff. No surprise um, that last year we were extraordinarily busy um, and we have to mark the year as a success. We're librarians, we measure everything. And a couple of the statistics uh, that relate to that, um, there were 351,676 visits to the library. 117,657 times someone checked something out. Those somethings were 648,551 books, DVDs, audiobooks, ebooks, iPads, Projectors, yes, we actually have projectors that people can check out and other things. 130,323 times someone logged on to our wireless network. It's a lot faster than what you have at home and it's probably a lot faster than what you have at work. Um, 104,923 times someone logged on to one of the library's computers. There are 20,000 people in this town, so that means on average five times people used it. 58,364 attended one of the programs that Amy spoke about. 2,603 times, someone used the Bloomberg Terminal. It's one of two Bloomberg Terminals in any library in the state. And not least, um, maybe last, 199 people read a microfilm. 
Why not least? Because many of them are engaged in priceless research into their families or Darien Library's history. Those are some of the uses that our patrons made of the library's resources. What's common about each one of them? Each one of them was paid for by donations of the Friends of the Library. The Friends of the Library are what make a difference in this library being the most active and most actively used library in the state. There's another way to look at last year and something that we are concentrating more and more on. Stephanie Anderson, when we were talking one day, taught me recently that Benjamin Franklin asked himself every morning, what good shall I do this day? And um, by the way, uh, that's the Benjamin Franklin that you think of as the discovery of electricity. He's the Benjamin Franklin that we think of as a librarian. Um, <laughs> We know that when people come to the library, they want to follow their passions, develop their interests, and improve their lives. And so we want them to be successful, and, and we ask ourselves, how can we make each patron's visit to the library today a once-in-a-lifetime event? Here's some of the things that uh, we can say that we did last year. For a young child coming into the McGraw Children's Library for the first time, setting off on a lifetime of reading, literacy, and learning. For many students who are here studying, as Amy said, we're here um, fairly late in the evening during midterms and finals, working their way toward higher education and the unlimited world that awaits them. For the active readers who talk about their next great book with the reader advisors. For the recent law school graduate who's used the library for six months to prep for the three successive state law boards that she took in succession on successive days, it turned out. Uh, for the dozens of local businesses who have relied on our user experience group to help them set up their website. For the architect who used our 3D printer to print out models of a design that he was doing. And for the jewelry designer here who did the same thing. And as Amy mentioned, we had 130 book groups that work with our reader advisors to plan their reading schedules. For the library user, who was driving in another state and whose GPS failed her, knew the library's phone number, called the library, and got online instructions on how to get to the absolutely can't miss meeting that she had to go to. There's also a certain Darian author who used the library for research in what she was doing. Um, and we're always happy to be judged by that sort of thing. We don't want to be judged by what we do, the books that we put on the shelf or anything like that, we want to be judged by the success that our users make of the resources that they find here. And the key to all of that is the library's most important resource, the one that goes down the elevators every night. Mine's the easiest job in the library. I have the privilege to work with this extraordinary group of people whose staff culture is remarkably unique. You won't find it in any other organization, and it's the key to our success. If I had to describe them, I'd say they are curious, open, inventive, and purposeful. Will all the library members who are here please stand? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh-oh. <laughs> Don't worry. Our speaker knows how to work this machine. <laughs> now on to the main event. Our speaker this evening is Kristen Harnish. Kristen drew upon her extensive research and experiences living in the San Francisco Bay Area and visiting the Loire Valley to create the story for the Vintner's Daughter, the first in a series about the changing world of vineyard life at the turn of the 20th century. Kristen has a degree in economics from Villanova University and currently resides in Darien, where she is chef, chauffeur, laundress, nurse, shrink, shopper, and maidservant to three young children and one terrific husband by day and a novelist by night. Please join me in a warm welcome for Kristen. Thank you. All right, let's 
see how this thing, there we go. Thank you so much, Amy. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm so pleased to be here tonight. Uh, I want to thank Alan Gray and uh, the Friends of the Darien Library and the entire Board of Trustees for inviting me. Um, and also, Mallory, where are you? Um, I don't know where she is, but she, uh, Mallory Arents, who invited me also here today. She's the Director of Adult uh, Programming here for the library. Um, and when she asked me to come, I have to tell you, um, I was a little emotional about it because I literally wrote the book in this library, the old location and this current location. So it was a wonderful thing to be, it's kind of coming full circle and be able to come speak to you today about my experience with the library and with novel writing and the, and the, whole, the whole smash. So thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Um, I also wanna thank Barrett Bookstore too um, for being here and offering to sell books at the event. I'll be signing books afterwards and personalizing them if you're so inclined, so come on over, don't be shy. Um, how lucky are we to have this institution here in our town of Darien? Um, the Darien Library, along with many friends who are in the room, uh, has really held my hand over the last 14 years uh, as I made the transition from banker to stay-at-home mom and then ultimately to published novelist last year. Very exciting. Um, so I want to share with you uh, my story and tell you a little bit about the inspiration and the research behind uh, The Vintner's Daughter and its sequel, which is called The California Wife. And that comes out in May, yay, May 2016, <laughs> woo! Um, <laughs> we're, yeah, some friends eagerly awaiting that. Um, some of my first readers right there, hi guys. Um, so to give you a little background, my husband David and I, Dave, raise your hand. Dave's right here in the front row. Um, couldn't have done it without him. We moved to Darien 14 years ago when I was pregnant with my first child, Ellen, who's now a, a freshman at the high school. I also have a uh, son at the middle school and another daughter at Hinley still, a first grader. So they're all spread out. Um, but it was also 14 years ago when I, I say, received the inspiration for the Vintner's daughter. Uh, my husband and I, before we had our first child, went on a trip to the Loire Valley. And uh, some of you may know there's a little town along the Loire River called Vouvray. It's very close to Amboise. And it's where they make wonderful white wines, sparkling wines, Chenin Blancs. Uh, and so this was our first trip there, and it was so much fun, not only to see the chateaus, but to also go around and see uh, the beautiful vineyards. And I had one of those moments where I was standing on the edge of a Vouvray vineyard where I just got the goosebumps because it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And the pristine rows of Chenin Blanc grape vines, there was a whitewashed winery to my left, and then there was this beautiful ledge of tufa limestone rock that ran on the western border of the vineyard. And it's where the family had carved out caves to store their and age their wines. And they had done it like generations ago, centuries ago. This is, has been, had been there for that long. And so I just started thinking to myself, you know, this would be the perfect setting for the novel that I'd always secretly wanted to write. And of course, I, had just, I was just making the transition from banker to stay-at-home mom, and, and the wheels started spinning. So I started asking questions of the vintners and the winemakers. I wanted to know, who were these families who for generations made these wines and crafted these wines? And how did they choose the grapes that they grew and the wines that they made? Um, and, and what kind of challenge did, challenges did they face? So I really started asking, luckily my, my father speaks fluent French, I do not. And so he started asking for me uh, the questions of these vintners. And then when I got back to the United States, I found myself even more interested in finding out, all right, so what happened in California in the 1800s when they started settling the wine country out there? Because I had lived in the San Francisco area, and I had visited Napa, and I knew that a lot of the people who had settled that winemaking area in Northern California had come from Italy and Germany and Hungary and France. So I thought that was such an interesting um, immigration story and because I am from an immigrant family myself and so I thought it would be so wonderful to have a character who made that transition from uh, France and and came over to Napa for the winemaking and so really the vendor's daughter is um, the story of Sarah Thibault who is uh, when the story starts she's a 17 year old winemaker's daughter um, who um, 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> what is that? Um, she's a 17-year-old winemaker's daughter who is struggling to reclaim her family's 19th century Loire Valley vineyard that was stolen from her. Um, and through a series of tragic events, all invented by me, uh, <laughs> she is forced to flee her homeland uh, and she's forced to, on a journey that takes her from um, France to the slums of Manhattan's Lower East Side and ultimately out to the rolling hills and sprawling vineyards of California's Napa Valley on her quest. Um, so when I started, when I came home from my, Fran my trip to France, I had all these questions about California, wine country and winemaking and all this, and where did I start? I headed right over to the Darien Library, and this is where it all started for me. So I just started asking questions. Um, now my husband, um, nearly every weekend, God bless you, uh, <laughs> I would leave him with my three little kids. Uh, he usually had one around each ankle uh, when I left. And you know, he'd inevitably would say something encouraging like, don't worry honey, I got this. <laughs> or it would be, go chase that dream, but please hurry back. <laughs> so he was wonderful though. And really with his encouragement, I came to the library every weekend and this is where I started researching and ultimately wrote the novel. Um, and so uh, the library provided me not only with a physical escape from you know, my home and the distractions of home, but it also provided me a huge like emotional and creative es um, escape. Um, from the, the diapers, the laundry, the cooking, um, as Amy mentioned earlier, all those, you know, the, the chauffeuring, um, and the whining, and that's whining with an H. <laughs> <laughs> so it really allowed me to tap into my creativity, and so I would, you know, rent out one of the little, or book one of the little quiet study rooms, or one of the larger rooms, and that is where I would sit for hours and do my writing. And that's where it all kind of came and it kind of gelled for me here in this library. So I, again, very emotional about it because this, for me, I could not have written my novel without the Darien Library and the wonderful librarians here. And uh, so thank you, thank you. Um, you know, one of the other things that happens when you're, I think any of you who have done something creative and, and you're endeavoring to do something outside of your comfort zone and what you're used to, um, we all have moments of just incredible self-doubt where you're like, what am I doing? What am I thinking? I can't write a novel. Like, what? I'm a banker. I'm like a stay-at-home mom. Like, what? What am I thinking? And so whenever I felt like that or I got, you know, writer's block, I would walk the stacks and I would walk through the library, nonfiction, fiction, cookbooks, it didn't matter. I would pull titles from the shelf. I would flip through. And I would think to myself, if all these people wrote a book, why the heck can't I? <laughs> That's really what I would do. And that gave me my little boost of confidence that I needed. I'm like, all right, let's put it in perspective. There's thousands of books here. So that's really kind of how I kind of like got my courage to go back in the room and keep writing. Um, and also, you know, every time I walked through those sliding glass doors, I was greeted by librarians with a smile on their face <laughs> And such an eagerness and willingness to help me with any of my research. And you know, one of the things you don't realize when you're writing, especially historical fiction, is how nitty gritty you have to get. I mean, you need to know what undergarments these people are wearing, even if you don't even use it in the novel. You need to know these things, what they're eating, what they're drinking, you know, what the medical care was. Um, you know, questions I like, for example. I came in one day and I said to Sally, is Sally here? I don't know if she's here. Yeah, okay, oh, there, you, there you are, okay. So I said, Sally, I said, you have got to help me. I just realized I need an English translation of the Napoleonic Criminal and Civil Codes, which was like established in 1802. And she's like, I got this, I got this. Okay, so she goes online and I mean, it wasn't even 10 minutes, I think, because you came and gave me the, oh, I got it. Yeah, and so it was, so I had that, because as you'll find out later, my character commits a crime, and so I kind of needed to know what the repercussions would be under Napoleonic law. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, this is why they're in the acknowledgments of the book, because things like this. And the, another time I had to um, find out, um, I asked, oh, I had to know the transcontinental railroad route that my heroine would take from New York to Napa, okay, in the middle of winter, 
what kind of stops would they make? Did they serve food? Do they have bathrooms? Like, what happened in 1896? How did this work? And so there's a book for that here in this library. I can show you where it is. But it, it's amazing, the things you can find. And even beyond that, um, these librarians got me books from like the Cornell University, like they, they just, you know, on, on grape farming and all these obscure things that I needed. And there must have been 100 books I ordered from other libraries across the state and country. And they got all of them for me. So thank you so much for that. I could not have done it without you. But these are the kind of things they do for you. No question is too obscure, I guarantee you. Test them. It's true. It's true. Um, so I'm trying. Oh, yeah. So what, beyond the library, I mean, obviously, I had to at some point go beyond the library and actually go to wine country, which was really a chore. Dave and I didn't want to do it. <laughs> we, we grabbed my mother, took her too. And in fact, we ended up biking in 90 degree heat, actually 100 degree heat that day, through the vineyards, uh, which was so much fun. Um, definitely wear helmets for that, yeah, especially if you're sampling wine after. And then um, we also took limo tours around to small family-owned vineyards and got to really know the families and the history of the winemaking and how they blended the wines and what kind of pests and um, mildew and mold and things like that that they face. Um, so it's really kind of interesting. Um, it was a fascinating trip. We had such a good time. Um, and then I also, um, so the, the librarians also turned me on to archive.org. I don't know if you've seen that, but basically you can go online and look at old newspapers. And one of the things I did was to craft the story, which is really a lot about the business of winemaking in the late 1800s. I went through years and years of the Pacific Wine and Spirit Review which has um, all sorts of fascinating information about not only um, winemaking back then in the 1800s, but also scientific innovations in winemaking um, and growing and also um, you know, imports, exports, the price of wine. So I really tried to make the book as accurate as possible. Um, and that, that you know, the librarians here helped me do that. It's so important when you're writing historical fiction because your, your goal is to really have the reader be transported through the sights and smells and, and you know, everything that you bring to them in your descriptions in the book and you really want them to feel like they're there. And so I'm hoping that you will feel that way when you read the book. Um, so I've totally gone off my notes, but whatever. Um, so <laughs> one of the things, so after my research, I, I think what I found most striking was the fact that, first of all, every glass of wine that we drink contains about, uh, excuse me, every bottle of wine contains about three pounds of grapes. Um, and the vulnerability of the fruit itself is striking. For the last century and a half, these grapes have been victim to pests and rodents and frost and mold and mildew and even prohibition here in the United States. But what's fascinating is these winemakers continue through a very specific blend of hard labor and science and art to perfect the wines that fill our glasses. And so it's very inspiring and humbling when I did this research to understand everything they went through. And in a way, it was a little bit like a metaphor for novel writing because I was just, you know, it's, a, it's an exercise in passion and persistence. It really, really is. And so um, I applaud them for their efforts. And it was one of the, um, un, I didn't expect to have um, that experience when I was researching the book, but it was one of the little joys, uh, the things that I got to learn about when I was researching it. Um, and so one of the things I also wanted to talk to you about uh, is the fact that um, a lot of people ask me when I'm speaking about the publishing process, and, and there's a real interest in how do you get a book published today? Because as we know, the industry is consolidating just like banking has done, and you, know, you have all these people who want to be published and only a few chosen who actually are. And that's why so many people are even self-publishing now, very high quality books actually, um, that are, are getting noticed. So it's really changing, and so I thought I'd take you a little bit through how I was eventually published. Um, obviously, I didn't just sit down and bang this out. It took 13 years um, of research, and I also had to learn how to write. I knew how to write a really mean marketing memo for my banking days. So I could write those till the cows came home. But to really write a piece of fiction that could keep the reader riveted was something I was not um, accustomed to and I didn't know how to do. So I took a lot of online writing classes through the Gotham's, Gotham Writers Workshop in New York City. Um, and that was great because people would critique my work, I would critique theirs, and then you kind of 
get a feeling for whether or not what you're writing is quality or how you need to change it. Um, and of course, I took out a lot of books from this library about novel writing and read those. So that was also another thing I did. And then about after 10 revisions, um, Autumn Howard, raise your hand. She was my first beta reader. Yes, and <laughs> thank you. And uh, which means she was one of the first people outside my family and my mom to read my book. Um, and so you gather all this critique and this um, information from readers, and you fix the book, you revise the book. And so after about 10 revisions, I sent it to a literary, literary agent, and then I sent it to another 22 literary agents. <laughs> They all rejected it. That was the first year. But you know what? It turned out to be a great thing, so don't cry for me. Um, you know, it was funny. The, the comments you get, some agents said, oh, it's too literary. Others said, it's too commercial. Um, <laughs> one actually said, there's just a little too much winemaking. And I said, I think you're missing the point. Um, but my favorite was the one who said to me, you know, I just love the writing and the story. It's wonderful. I just don't know how I'm going to market it. I'm like, it's about women and wine. <laughs> really? Is it that much of a stretch? Come on. So, you know, you get, you, you really have to, you know, it's just like, it's just like, you know, marriage. You got to pick the right person because, it, and you have to know what you're looking for and they have to know what they're looking for and that's when it comes together. So, um, you know, basically, uh, I just decided it would be published. I didn't know how, but I would just keep going. Um, and then all of a sudden, one of my author friends connected me with one of her friends who was an agent and happened to be looking for book club fiction and thought that my book might fit the bill. And wouldn't you know it, uh, we connected and my agent lives in Sonoma and she, she vacations in France. So it's all good, it all worked out. So she's fantastic. And so within three months of signing with her, her name's April Everhart, um, within three months of signing with her, we got a two book deal from HarperCollins Canada right away, which was really exciting. That was my Tom Cruise jumping on Oprah's couch moment. You know what I mean? Like, I was so excited. Um, and then right after that, She Writes Press in the United States followed. They're a small press out of Berkeley. And so they're publishing, uh, they published The Vintner's Daughter, and they'll be publishing the sequel as well in May. Um, and then after that, deals in Hungary and the Netherlands followed, so it's also published there. And then you're gonna love this story, okay? So I still can't believe this kismet, total fate. So I retained the audio rights for my book, and so I wanted to produce an audio book. And I didn't know anything about it or how I'd do it. So Pat Tone, where are you, are you here? is she here? Pat Tone, no, okay. So Pat Tone, she um, started a, uh, she did an audio book um, I don't know what you call it, just like a, a session for adults to come learn about audiobooks and how they're made. And she invited two voice actors. I don't know if any, any of you went to that. It was awesome. So she invited two voice actors to come speak and, and hear um, them. They did excerpts from their books. And so I was in the audience taking notes and wondering, okay, how this comes about. So I struck up a conversation afterwards with um, the voice actress who did a lovely reading. And turns out she's like an award-winning voice actor. She did like Wally Lamb's We Are Water. Her name's Tavia Gilbert. And so we started up a conversation via email. And she said, you know, why don't I just introduce you to some of the editors I know at, at the audiobook places like Blackstone or whatever. I was like, oh my gosh, that would be awesome if you wouldn't mind just making an introduction. And then I'll take it from there. So she introduced me to the editor at Blackstone Audio. And within three weeks, they had given me an offer to do the book. And then Tavia did the reading, and she does a wonderful job with all these different accents, French accents, it's amazing. And all because of the Darien Library. Yeah, I got my audiobook deal because of this library. Right here in this room. That's awesome. Come on. So, I mean, I, I just, I can't say enough. This is where the magic happens, people. This is where the magic happens, I'm convinced of it. Um, so what I'd like to do now for you, you've been a lovely audience, and I'd like to just read an excerpt from the book and then take some questions, if I could, okay? All right, so I thought I'd just read you the first few pages so you can get a feel for the story. So this is The Vintner's Daughter. Okay. Can you all hear me good? Yeah, I guess I should ask that earlier, but. <laughs> Chapter 1, Confession, June 30th, 1896, New York City. The air was thick with the putrid smell of man and horse. 
Sarah Tebow walked swiftly up Mott Street, taking care to lift the hem of her dress and sidestep the heaps of muck without breaking her stride. Like the squabbling of chickens, the street noises swirled all around her. Above her, women beat rugs and draped bedding from the wrought iron fire escapes, shouting to the children who ran wild in the streets below. The clanging bell of an omnibus and the braying of donkeys unnerved her. This was not the America that Sarah had envisioned. Push carts lined the muddy road, their proprietors selling everything from potatoes to laudanum and speaking in languages Sarah could not understand. Bicycles squeaked by, rag pickers hollered from their doorway perches, and street urchins cried out and tugged at her skirt with their grimy hands as she passed. Sarah knew she should not be walking alone, yet to bring a companion would have invited judgment that was reserved for God alone. She wondered if God walked with her now, guiding her down the street toward salvation, away from her sin. God was a tricky business. Sarah believed in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and had even successfully enlisted St. Anthony on occasion to help her find a misplaced trinket. Yet did she truly believe that God would condemn her to burn in hell for what she had done? If God was everywhere, surely he'd been present that night. He'd seen what had happened. She could not turn back now. Sarah focused her eyes straight ahead. It would be a relief to reach the quiet peace of the church and inhale its fragrant burning incense. Sarah had arrived in New York four weeks ago, but she had yet to make her confession. She was dressed in her best, a simple dress of pale blue cotton and a claret colored shawl. A straw bonnet with a wide cream ribbon concealed her reddish brown hair, which many of the villagers in Vouvray had considered her finest feature. Not anymore, she thought, as her fingertips attempted to smooth the jagged edge of chopped hair at the nape of her slender neck. Sarah was unusually tall for a woman and did not possess the plumpness that seemed to be considered so pleasing in females. Her limbs were long, lean, and agile. She kept her elbows tucked in at her sides as she approached the corner of Mott and Prince. The stone facade of the church towered before her, the height of eight men. On its front steps, a squat balding man in a priest habit shouted, out, out, as he wildly waved a broom to chase a group of lively urchins down the steps. On another day, Sarah would have laughed, but today her spirits were subdued and her heart heavy. Inside, the marble altar with its carved reredos, leafed in gold, loomed before her. She pulled three silver dollars from her pocket, which she'd earned for this purpose by selling her hair, and dropped them one by one into the collection box. The sound echoed through the massive church. Once the silence returned, Sarah could only hear the pounding of her heart. She made her way to the confessional, once inside, she sat down, removed her shawl, and draped it over her lap. While she waited, she bunched its soft yarn between her fingers anxiously. Sarah heard the creaking of wood, and then the carved screen before her was abruptly thrown open. She knelt down, straightened her back, and inhaled sharply. She felt her throat tighten. To calm herself, she fixed her eyes on the holes in the screen before her and then swallowed hard, preparing to speak. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Santi, Amen, she said quietly as she made the sign of the cross. Forgive me, mon père, for I have sinned. It has been six weeks since my last confession. The shadow on the other side of the partition cleared its throat and stifled what Sarah thought sounded like a yawn. Very well, you may confess your sins. She was trapped within the walls of the confessional and she could not leave until she declared her guilt aloud. Father, I killed a man. You have to read the rest. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's really fun. So we have time for a few questions, right? Like, yeah. 
Don't be shy. It's the second, the second book. Is it, yes. is it the same main character? Is it a it sequel is. or is it a completely it's a, to it's a sequel. And in fact, it starts in the same scene where this book ends. So yes, it's a sequel. And it's even broader in scope. It takes the family um, from, let me see, 1897, the end of 1897, all the way through the great earthquake and fire of San Francisco in 1906. Mm -hmm. So that was also, again, the library for the research. That was. <laughs> Really, really fun and amazing stuff to research. So yeah, yeah, excited. Thank Before you. Before you yes. even went to Blueberry, um, what got you thinking about writing a novel? What, 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 was there other things? Because obviously yeah. you, 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 were, you were thinking about writing a novel or something. Yes, like, yes. That's right. And you know, I think it's because I was such a huge reader. And as a child, I spent all the weekends, I was kind of like a book nerd. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I loved it. And I used to spend, um, you know, weekends in my local library in, in the back. I lived in Mystic, actually. And in the back um, of the library, just reading for hours. And it was usually historical fiction or history that I enjoyed reading. And I think I always wanted to be an English major. I was an economics major, but I wanted to be an English major or a literature major. I should have been a librarian. It's really what I should have done. <laughs> that would have been cool. Because um, <laughs> really, I, I, I wanted to. But my father rightfully said to me, um, so you're going to be a journalist? And I said, oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think I have the skills for that. And he said, well, are you going to teach? And I said, I don't think I'd be a very good teacher. And he's like. So what you know? What are you gonna? Are you gonna write a novel? And at 21, I really didn't feel equipped to say anything important about anything as a novelist. So I ended up being an economics major. But I always had that love of it and the love of the classics. And so I was. I'm just thrilled that I was given the opportunity and able to do it. Yeah. Good question. Yes, sir. This starts in New York, but do you flash back to Blueberry Ranch? Yeah. So this actually, this is. Um, I pulled out a future scene and put it at the front of the book. So yes, the next chapter puts you in the family's vineyard in Vouvray. And then um, the heroine travels from Vouvray uh, and then through New York and then finally out to Napa. What yes. Time so the story starts in 1895 and goes through 1897. Yeah. Yeah. So right. And also it's a really interesting time in our nation's history because women were really literally coming out of the kitchens at that point, starting to work in their far, in the family farms and the family businesses and the Industrial Revolution. And it was just a lot of exciting things happening. And then the suffrage movement and the women's rights movement. So a lot of that plays into as threads of the novel, through, through the novel. So it was a really a fun, fun time to research. I enjoyed it. Yes, What Ellen. part of your first draft survives in what was published? That's a really good question. Not much. <laughs> and when my editor got a hold of it, God bless her, she did an even better job. Um, yeah, no, a lot of it was not. I think the early scenes in Vouvray, because I had just visited it, and when I wrote those scenes and the settings, a lot of the settings that I, I described stayed. But a lot of the dialogue and you know what was happening, because what happens is you get to a point when you're writing and you don't have enough fire. There's not enough going on to keep me sustained or the reader sustained. And it's what they call the muddle in the middle. And one of the best things, the best cures for the muddle in the middle is really to throw your character in more distress and then see what happens. Like give them another big problem. And so that's what I found myself doing more than anything is creating more hurdles for my character, which was sad but important because really in the arc of her story and her character development, it was absolutely necessary because she was only 17 when the story started and 19 when it ended. So that's really what I spent a lot of time doing. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Have you started on number three yet? I'm researching number three, so you'll see me in the library. <laughs> yeah. And so number three is going to be the legacy book, which actually will take the family um, through World War I and Prohibition, which are really, and you know, World War I is tricky. Um, luckily, my father knows a lot about the subject, so he keeps giving me books on it. But to really speak intelligently about it, you know, I feel like I need to, you know, interview, you know, or look, read through interviews with World War One veterans. Like, I really need to dig in deeper for this one. And so, because you want, you want to do it justice. You don't want to, yeah, so that's the tricky part. It's a lot of research with this one. But it's fun. And librarians, I hope you help me with this. <laughs> Go from end of the first book to the second. 
Okay, so true story. My um, agent gets the, uh, gets the offer from HarperCollins Canada, they're interested. And so we're on the phone and she goes, so I forgot, is this a series? And I'm like, yes it is. <laughs> and I don't know what possessed me to say that. I just wanted to reach out and take it back, but I couldn't. And I was in, it was a new relationship with this agent, so I just write there committed. And I'm really glad I did, because it was such a joy to write the second one. But it's one of those things, you know, writing is just a pure act of faith. You, are, you don't know how this is going to end up. I've written so much that is really bad. And, you know, and then you find that little gem, and that's what you work on. Um, and so you have to kind of just jump into it and say, yeah, I'm going to do that. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but yes, that will happen. And so thankfully, uh, my husband, again, was wildly supportive as I hunkered down for 18 months and wrote the sequel. Yeah. So that was, it was, it was hard. Yes? Do you think there'll be made into a miniseries? Oh, gosh, I hope so. I'm thinking Stars miniseries. What do you think? Um, or HBO. Uh, we actually have it with a film agent now in LA, and they're shopping it. So fingers crossed. That would be awesome. You know, it could be 20 years from now. Who knows, right? Um, but hopefully. So everybody pray. <laughs> yes? Do you find that the online workshops had good writers? Yeah. They really did, and I was surprised um, that I could get so much out of an online course. It was a t they, they were each 10-week courses. One was on fiction writing and one was on novel writing. And it was very, um, we'd work on something different, like you know, theme, plot, dialogue, every week. And then you get to share a couple pages with the other people in the class, and everyone was, and the rule was you had to say two constructive things and then you could hit them with the, you know. This is what's bad. Um, so it was really good because it was very structured and I got a lot out of it. But there comes a point in time where you have to just say, I can't take classes anymore. I really have to write this thing. And that was the scary part. Yeah. So, but, but it gave me enough confidence to be able to do that. Yeah. So I found it very worthwhile. Very much so. Yeah. Yes, Pam. So, Kristen, you never wrote anything prior to this. You don't have short I, stories in a drawer. I don't have it in a drawer. I'm not Jane Austen. No, no. I wish I, I wish I did because then it'd make it easier to pull something out and work it on, work on it. But um, no, I didn't. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. I love to read short stories. I am not good at writing them. I just, they're not my thing. Most authors get published in magazines or do short stories beforehand. Me, I don't know what I was thinking. I just dove in and just bit off this huge thing, but I just felt like the story compelled me. I knew it was a novel, I knew it wasn't a short story, and I knew it was like, in my mind, it played like a movie. So, it reads like a movie. oh, thank you, dear, thank you. And um, yeah, so that's, no, that, that's, I never wrote anything except a 20-page paper in English before that, yeah. Yes, sir? When you were a college student and choosing a, a career, yeah. uh, I, I know many economics majors go into banking. Yeah. And, and then when you became a banker, was that a good use of your skills, your personality, your interest, what you were good at? That's a really good question. And then, and then ultimately, when you leave, was you burn out and you need yeah. to hang out? Or, or, or All that, or, right there. All, everything you just said. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a really, you know what was great about it? I actually grew up in a military family. And um, I was an introvert, a real reader, and uh, I was forced to move every two or three years, which was really challenging. My dad uh, drove submarines out of New London, actually. Um, and so we moved all around the eastern seaboard out to California. So that was really hard, and that was my first challenge with my personality being quiet and, you, know, you wouldn't know it now, but, but in fact, um, that was really challenging for me, and so it got me out of my shell. And economics in college was the same thing for me. Um, you know, it was theoretical, but I was learning, I was also taking a lot of finance courses, so it was really good in terms of um, learning the other side of things, like the hardcore numbers, and then going into banking really gave me a great sense of how to, um, and Dave and I talk about this all the time, but because we, we actually met at Chase, which is now J.P. Morgan Chase, and it really taught us to manage by fact. And that's a term that people don't always do that nowadays, but even running my own business um, now as an author, it's so valuable to me because I can analyze the numbers, I can see where my book's selling, and I can decide on marketing strategies based on that. And so I really, and also in writing the book, I didn't know how, many, how much math I was going to have to do to write this book. I mean, just to convert, you know, the tons of grapes into, um, you know, how many barrels and how many bottles that is, and then what's the angel share, and, the, you know, I mean, it just goes on. I was doing so many calculations, so it really came in handy. 
and it really was great. But it, in banking in general, I did burn out. It wasn't, I knew it wasn't what I was supposed to be doing, you know? It wasn't my, my thing, it wasn't my passion, exactly. Um, my kids are my passion, my husband is my passion, my, and writing is a passion of mine. And so I was lucky enough to be able to explore that when I was at home with the kids. Yeah, so did that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, sir. How did you deal with all that rejection? Which is writers and actors. Yeah, you know what? It's really brutal at first because you spend so much time and you put it out there. But the way I look at it is um, there, and no, not everyone's going to like your book. You know, you'll go on Amazon and you'll see some horrible review and it'll like ruin your day. I try not to look at them, but you know, it happens. And really, what you do is I, I realize that I wrote my book for a particular audience. And that audience enjoys it. And that's really all I can ask for. You know what I mean? And so if it wasn't the agent didn't want it or the publisher didn't want it, then it just wasn't a good fit. And that's kind of how you have to talk yourself um, through it. And the other thing is I kind of made it into a sport. Like I would get a rejection and I'd be like, all right, what do you got that's fresh? Come on. Like, come on. <laughs> but, you know, like where's the one I haven't heard yet? And every once in a while there'd be something really good, like a nugget about why they rejected it. And so oftentimes I would take that and incorporate it, and that advice, into revising the novel. So that was good. Yeah. The best retort to, uh, to the Asian who said uh, there's too much wine. Um, <laughs> you should have asked them. But maybe there's too much wailing in Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That is good. Oh, I wish you'd been there. That, that would have been a good one. Yes? Is there anything your editor, your first readers, really wanted out that you felt compelled to keep in because it was true to like how you saw it? You know, actually, there's one word that my Canadian publisher took out. There's a, an, there's a final line in one of the chapters that says, uh, where Philippe is thinking to himself, um, I wrote it, he never felt like such a jackass. And jackass was a term at that time, and it was a donkey, a mule, and it was a, a derogatory term. Um, and my, my Canadian publisher didn't like it. And I said, well, why? I mean, that's how, he's a man, like, he's, like, he's not going to soften it. Like, he, she just felt like a jerk, and I didn't have the word jerk, and that's the word they would have used, because it's historically accurate. And she said, well, I think fool is the word we should use. I'm like, it just doesn't have the same punch. So I kept my word for the U.S. version, um, and she kept her word for the Canadian <laughs> version. And then the other thing that really got me was, and, and don't get me wrong, I love my Canadian editor, but she said to me, she said, uh, um, we were talking about Philippe, who's the main, another main character in here, and she, I said, you know, he had ambition. And she said, well, I think he had dreams. I said, no, he didn't. I said, he's a man, and he doesn't have dreams. Okay? If he's a woman, he can have a dr dreams. But if he's a man, he's got, he has hardcore ambition. I mean, this guy wants to own the biggest vineyard in Napa by 1900. That's ambition, you know? Like it's, and she's like, okay, we'll keep your word. And so, you know, it was one of those, like, just little, but it's these little words that you argue over. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that she did, which was wonderful, is she told me that I needed to really draw out the relationship between the sisters in this book. Sarah has a sister named Lydia. And she said, you know, readers really love that interaction between the sisters, and we want to know more about their childhood and growing up. And so, really, we teased a lot of that out and developed that and added it to the story, so it really... I think added a nice dimension to the book. So she was a wonderful um, mentor to me. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We have to. Oh, do we have to go soon? Yeah. It's five hours. I like got swept away. Okay. You want to? Yes. Go ahead. We'll do it real quick. Did you have trouble starting? You know, like when you know your story, did you have trouble starting off where it begins and the narrator? Did you have trouble keeping the I, I knew that the story was going to go between two different points of view, um, and I think I do often have time starting out the story, and what I will do is I will start on the scene that is really the most interesting to me, and that's where I'll go. It, I don't write sequentially. I have a general idea of what the story is going to look like at the end, but I'll write the scene that's most exciting for me that day, and that's what I will write, because I, and it's usually something with a heavy conflict that is really exciting dialogue. And so that's why I try to make the, the book is, you know, I try to make the book like that. And so that's what I do, yeah. And the narrator, did you have trouble with voice that, you know? Um, I knew it wasn't, 
going to be first person because I wasn't comfortable writing in first person, but I basically um, wrote from Sarah's perspective and Philippe's perspective in the novel. And then the sequel has three different points of view. But um, yeah, but the narrator, she just, she spoke to me. So she starts the book, yeah, yeah. Good questions. So I think we should, so let's, you know, move on to the reception. And I'm assigning books and happy to answer questions. Amy, would you like to say a few words before we? Thank you so much. For last year too. Pages seem to disappear. All right. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I don't think I need them anyway. Thank you so much. We will, um, we hope you will come back because now we are going to be very interested to hear what happens to Sarah Thibault in the next phase. So I think we'd all like you to come back. And um, isn't it fun that at the Darien Library, books aren't just circulated, but they're actually created here. And then I just thought of all the staff who helped Kristen write this, and you must feel a feeling of almost parentage about this, which is, it's, it's really, really fun. It's so great. Um, before we depart, I'd like to ask all the trustees to come down here after the meeting so that we can elect um, our officers. Um, I hope that you will first stop at the table and uh, buy Kristen's wonderful book and get her to sign it for yourself, and then enjoy the reception. And again, I just have to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts to all the friends of the library for, um, we obviously have a talented staff who, who dream big. They have ambitions and dreams here. And they big, dream big and bold, but it's the friends of the library who enable those dreams to become a reality that benefit the whole town of Darien. So thank you again for coming. Exactly.